Hello, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center here in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of Conservationists in Action, where we bring out prominent scientists, authors, historians to talk about their work with a broad national public. I appreciate you all tuning in. And before I introduce this afternoon's guest, I'd just like to remind you all that this is a live uh, broadcast, so we'd really encourage any of you to call in questions. Uh, we'll be running a phone number. If you have a question, please feel free to call in at any time and ask uh, William a question. Also, those of you who are at facilities that have a uh, push to talk microphone uh, at any time, if you'd like, just push uh, the button, talk into the microphone, and let us know you're out there waiting to ask a question. And we'd be more than happy to take it and even maybe answer it. So please do uh, interact with this live broadcast. Today we have a very special guest. We're very fortunate to have William Souder with us. William is an author, uh, a former journalist, and I think a first for us, uh, a Pulitzer Prize nominated author uh, for this particular book, Under a Wild Sky, John James Audubon and the Creation, excuse me, The Making of the Birds of America. It's a, it's a wonderful book, uh, a fascinating history and uh, a description of early America and some of the entrepreneurs like Audubon that helped make it. So William, welcome to NCTC. Thank you, Mark. Really it's nice, nice it. to be here. This is a beautiful uh, uh, facility, nice place to visit, although I'm from Minnesota. And uh, when you live in Minnesota and you travel in February, you hope it's going to be warmer than it is at home. But it isn't here in West Virginia today, but it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's about 20 it's, with a one degree wind chill. We, it's nice to be here, though. We tried to recreate your native habitat. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do that in fish and wildlife for, for <laughs> endangered species. Well, uh, William, the, the first question I'd like to ask you before we, we take some call in questions would be. Uh, What's your background? How did you come to, to write this book and previous books? Well, this particular book grew out of some research I was doing into uh, 19th century naturalists, particularly people who were kind of based in and around Charleston, uh, okay. South Carolina. Um, and uh, one of the things that I had been told is that these were contemporaries of Audubon. And, um, and so I, I decided that I would do some looking into Audubon's life. And when I did that, I found that there really weren't any recent books about him. Okay. And uh, so that piqued my interest and I sort of proceeded from there. But prior to this book, uh, I had written, uh, my first book was about frogs and specifically about these outbreaks of deformed frogs that mm -hmm. uh, surfaced across North America really in the mid-1990s. And uh, that sort of set me on a path of uh, looking into um, uh, biology and natural history uh, history of science, these all became uh, things that I was interested in. So Audubon was a natural because he cuts across all of those, all those disciplines. You raise an interesting question. Why do you think there hadn't been uh, a recent biography of Audubon? Well, I'm not sure. There was a bumper crop the year that I did mine. <laughs> yeah. uh, so other people had the same idea. There were other people <laughs> with the same idea. Uh, there was a very good life of Audubon published in 1964 by Alice Ford, who was sort of the definitive Audubon scholar. And uh, prior to that, a number of other uh, biographies, and they're of mixed quality. Mm -hmm. But um, for whatever reason, there just hadn't been one in a while. Let's talk about the book. It's, okay. a, it's a great book. Um, I think it would be of, of great interest to historians, environmental historians, historians of science, and bird lovers in general. And um, one of the interesting things was, was Audubon's um, cryptic youth. What did, what did you find out about where Audubon <laughs> well, was from? Uh, it, well. Audubon is sort of a complex composite character. He um, uh, was born on the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which is now called Haiti. Uh, Haiti, of course, is one of the poorest countries in the world now, but in those days, which is the late 1700s, it was one of the wealthiest colonies in the New World. It was a major producer of sugar and coffee. And uh, Audubon's father was a sea captain named Audubon uh, who had a plantation on the island and uh, sort of a stable of mistresses. And uh, Audubon was the, uh, the product of one of those liaisons. Uh, his father had a real actual wife back in France, but Audubon was born illegitimately in 1785 on the island of Haiti and then uh, at the age of six evacuated back to France with a half-sister when there was an insurrection on the island. And, and this is an important part of his personal history because 
Um, this sort of followed him throughout his life. He, mm -hmm. he felt obliged and his parents encouraged him to be a little bit um, circumspect about exactly who he was and where he had come from. And, and uh, so around that sort of original um, sketchiness about his origins, there grew up some other embellishments about himself that he traded in throughout his life and kind of gave him the reputation of a, a somewhat dubious character in, in some people's minds. Why did he try to hide that he was from? Haiti. Well, I, <laughs> today I, I... it's not entirely clear to me. I, it's, it's hard to say how much stigma was attached to the illegitimacy, but that was certainly part of it. Um, his parents had actually sent him back to the New World from France in 1803, the same year that Lewis and Clark head for the West Coast. Uh, Audubon arrived uh, in Philadelphia, where his father owned another large farm. And the reason that they sent him over, uh, changing his name to John James Audubon and getting some papers that would attest to that, was that he was about to be conscripted into Napoleon's army. And they thought he would be um, a bad soldier material. So Audubon was not only illegitimately born and with a, a sort of an assumed name, but also draft dodger when he got <laughs> off the ship in, uh, in New York. And, and perhaps for all those reasons, plus a sort of innate desire to impress people, he started telling uh, stories about himself that were not always entirely true. I, I think it's fascinating because he's even portrayed on your book cover the quintessential buckskin-clad American naturalist. Yet I wonder how many Americans realize he's French <laughs> in origin. Well, he he would have been. <laughs> he didn't even learn to speak English until he was 18, and and, wow. and years later, in his 30s and 40s, he still wrote in a very stilted, <laughs> stiff, and kind of curious brand of English. I'm sure that he spoke throughout his life with a heavy French accent and would have pronounced his name Audubon and not Audubon the way we say it. The, you do an interesting thing in this book and it was unexpected to me. Uh, throughout the first third of the book you kind of intersperse his story with Alexander Wilson who uh, in many ways is, is somewhat more quintessentially American, although not American. <laughs> originally, originally from Scotland. Yes. Yeah. Well, Tell us a little about uh, Well, Wilson. Alexander Wilson was uh, Audubon's nemesis, or at least his roadblock to success right. in America. Uh, Wilson had arrived in the United States in around 1790, and uh, just before Audubon got here, Wilson had also embarked on a very similar project to uh, Audubon's Birds of America. Uh, he, it's an illustrated uh, study of American birds called American Ornithology. Mm -hmm. It's mostly text, but there are 103 hand-colored engraved plates of uh, American birds, draw illustrated drawings of American birds that accompany that volume. And at the time of its publication, which happened in, in installments between 1803 and 1813, um, it was considered the most important publishing enterprise ever undertaken on American soil, certainly the most time-consuming, probably the most expensive. And because this came at a time when American science was eager to kind of reclaim or to claim, lay claim right. to uh, control over our, our, own, our own science, um, it was also regarded as an important scientific accomplishment. And so in Philadelphia, where Wilson was based, and particularly at the Academy of Natural Sciences, um, American ornithology really became almost a co-production of Alexander Wilson and the Academy, and really was um, regarded as a very important statement by American science to the rest of the world, sort of declaring that we were capable of identifying and doing the taxonomy and doing the illustrated representations of our own wildlife, which up until then had been done mostly by Europeans. So Wilson was a jealously guarded friend and, and uh, <laughs> colleague by many of the people in power in Philadelphia. I've got another question on Wilson, but we do yeah. have a picture of Wilson we might want to punch Let's up. see if we can go ahead to it. There yeah, he is. This is rather dashing. Uh, here he is. He, he was from Paisley, Scotland, he was, uh, which is a weaving town. He was a weaver by trade, and like a lot of um, Europeans, he came to America under sort of questionable circumstances. He'd run afoul of some political uh, movement in, in Scotland. Had actually been jailed at one time for insolvency, and uh, so really was a sort of a self-made person when he got to the United States. Uh, initially worked as a school teacher. Uh, and then got interested in, in uh, making drawings and studying birds and really committed himself to that uh, at the end of a fairly young life. He died when he was 49, but mm -hmm. the last 10 years or so he spent really working on birds. We actually do have one of Wilson's volumes in our archives. <laughs> and it's, do uh, you really? Yeah, and it's oh. a beautiful one, and it has, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, one of his um, 
drawings of the uh, passenger pigeon, which is kind of neat. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, why do you think Wilson is so little remembered today, even though he predated Audubon, and Audubon is so re remembered today? There's no Wilson Society. <laughs> no, no, there isn't. Although we should we should be careful to point out that the Audubon Society is not named. It's named for Audubon, right. but he did not found the no, Audubon no. Society. The, the Audubon right. Society came along about a half century after Audubon died, and it's far from clear that he would be a candidate for membership in the Audubon <laughs> Society. He was not much of a conservationist, but then he lived in a time when conservation really hadn't uh, become an, an animating concept for anybody, and right. so that's not particularly surprising. I, I suppose the reason that Wilson is less remembered is because Audubon simply eclipsed him through his talent, through the, um, the scale of the birds of America, which completely dwarfs both physically and in terms of just bird count, uh, everything mm -hmm. that uh, Wilson had accomplished. And so uh, I think it's a case of uh, uh, the better of the two artists and naturalists eventually winning out in the public mind. I, I do want to say, though, that I think Wilson did very important work, very seminal work. Uh, and it's pretty clear that he was an inspiration for Audubon. They actually met when mm -hmm. Audubon owned a general store in Louisville in 1810. Alexander Wilson came through town peddling subscriptions to American ornithology. And Audubon was actually about to subscribe, even though he didn't have much money. He was right. gonna he was gonna sign up to uh, to buy Wilson's book, and um, and his partner interrupted and said, "Why do you want to buy that when your drawings are much better?" <laughs> at, at which point Wilson, shocked, asked if Audubon actually had some drawings of birds that he could see, and and uh, and Audubon did, and of course they were quite uh, impressive compared to to Wilson's. What did Wilson say? <laughs> We'd only I, have Audubon. We uh, uh, we don't know for sure what Wilson said uh, in his diaries and journals, which got uh, edited and and uh, perhaps uh, sanitized a little bit later on by his literary executors. Wilson concedes that he met Audubon and that Audubon showed him around and, and that he had an impressive collection of drawings. Uh, the only other contact between these two that we know about is one claimed by Audubon. Several years later, he said he went to Philadelphia and called on Wilson, kind kind of the cold shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> how do Wilson's drawings, we, we don't have any of those, we'll show you we some. Do have, we do oh, have you some do. Wilson yeah, drawings. How do yeah. they differ? Well, let's take a look. Oh. Here's a page from American Ornithology, and uh, this is actually a useful example to take a look at. There's four birds here. There's a, a nuthatch, a black-capped chickadee, although Wilson also identified that as a nuthatch, a species of nuthatch. And then, of course, a robin and, and a wood thrush. And I think this really illustrates... Um, the state of the art at the time Wilson completed it. This is how natural history studies were done. Uh, it's a very formal, a very posed, um, a very static representation, almost always against a very neutral or, or blank background, uh, almost always in profile, uh, invariably with the birds in an inanimate posture, wings folded against their bodies. Um, they're really quite beautiful, and if you've seen the original, and I gather you have, yeah. uh, they're lovely drawings. The, we, should, we should add that these are all watercolors, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're quite pretty, and this was just the way things were done. This was the accepted approach, and, and this is one of the reasons why Wilson's work was so hard to dislodge, because uh, when we look at one of Audubon's images in a minute, we'll see how much he changed the, uh, the whole playing field for this. I think we have another page here. This is another page from American Ornithology, oh, okay. and, and this owl was one of the first birds that Wilson trained himself on. He had an owl, a stuffed owl, and he would sit for hours making sketch after sketch after sketch. And I think, as you can see from this drawing, he never really got it completely right. Uh, I think that the face of an owl is a very dominant feature, and I think it probably overtakes this image a little bit. I'm not sure the proportions uh, quite make sense. Uh, the proportions of the other birds relative to the owl uh, are probably close, but maybe a little bit random. Uh, this certainly looks better than its earlier sketches, but uh, it doesn't look anything like Audubon's representation. Yeah, by the way, uh, Wilson called this the red owl, and it's what we know as the barred owl now. Right. So when Audubon came really out of the American wilderness after close to two decades of living on the frontier and making drawings, uh, he came back to Philadelphia looking for somebody to publish his mm -hmm. drawings, to, to hire him as a museum curator, to, to be his patron. He really didn't know for sure what he wanted to do. Uh, but he was met with a lot of skepticism, and particularly from uh, people at the Academy of Natural Sciences who were married to Wilson and to his work. And when they saw Audubon's portfolio, 
uh, it didn't look right to them. And, and I think we have a page here. <laughs> now look at the, the difference between this image and what we saw with Wilson. I mean, here you have, this is completely different. This changes everything about wildlife illustration forever. And this is what makes Audubon uh, the fault line between uh, the way things had always been done and the way they would be done uh, after he established himself. It didn't work out for him in Philadelphia, but mm -hmm. it eventually uh, would. This is a, a species that Audubon called the great-footed hawk. Uh, we know it as the, as the um, uh, peregrine falcon. The peregrine falcon is, of course, one of nature's great predators. Uh, they eat other birds and they kill them by diving on them from great heights. They usually uh, kill their prey in midair. Uh, this pair of peregrine falcons is uh, dining on a green-winged teal and a gadwall. And if you look closely, you can see a feather floating in the background. You can see a little bit of blood dripping from one of the beaks uh, uh, of uh, one of the falcons. And, uh, of course, it's it's what nature is. It's kind of a busy, active, gory, predatory mess. And uh, Audubon did this because he wanted his birds to be real. And so there were several ways that he accomplished that. One was to show them in action, not always, but when yeah. he could. Uh, <clears throat> if they were predatory birds, to show them with prey. Or sometimes if they were prey, to show them escaping from other uh, predators. The other thing that's important, and it's a little difficult to tell because the slides are kind of all the same size here, is the enormous size of this image. Every one of Audubon's birds was painted to its exact complete life size, a one-to-one -one ratio. These are full-size renderings of every single species. And there's a total of 437 species represented in the Birds of America. And so uh, sometimes you'll hear the Birds of America referred to as the double elephant folio. Mm -hmm. That's a reference to the size of the paper that Audubon used. It was the largest commercially available uh, paper you could get, and it was called Double Elephant. <laughs> it's about 30 inches wide by about 40 inches high, or the reverse, depending on how it's, how right. it's oriented. But huge, huge sheets of paper uh, that were eventually bound up into volumes of oh, either four or five volumes for the complete set. These were coffee table books that were bigger and heavier than the actual coffee table. <laughs> you would, <laughs> yeah, you huge. Would maybe, maybe 400 put them on. sheets of something like that. So when Audubon came <laughs> to Philadelphia with these, uh, these drawings, uh, everyone remarked on how different they were, but not everyone agreed that they were different in a good way. They, to some people, they seemed a little garish, a little over the top, uh, perhaps offensive to delicate mm -hmm. sensibilities, uh, and uh, just not done in the conventional manner. And when that was sort of combined with Audubon's kind of sketchy details about exactly who he was and where he came from, I mean, he arrived in town in buckskins, and nobody had seen him in 14, 15 years. Uh, he just did not have a good reception in Philadelphia. But a few people did tell him that uh, if you go to Europe, you'll find somebody who will reproduce these for you because they're really quite sure. magnificent. And that would lead two years later to his trip to, uh, to England to search for a publisher there. Do we know where he got his ideas from to portray birds and, and nature in action? This, this wasn't being done by other naturalists like um, Wilson and so on, but w was this occurring in other art fields or? You know, not that I know of. I, I think I, I'm convinced his main inspiration was his father. And when Audubon was a boy, really, and starting to make drawings, he would complain to his dad that he... Uh, he was always disappointed in the results because he would take his gun and shoot a bird and spend a lot of time painting it, and when he was done, it would look like a dead bird, which is right. what it was. And his father uh, would always tell him, don't worry about it, that's just the way it is. Uh, no artist, no matter how great, can ever bring to life on paper something that's actually dead. And I think Audubon devoted himself to proving his father wrong for the rest of his life. But his art really kind of grew out of... Um, an interest from a very early age in making birds look real and alive in the way he saw them. And because he spent countless hours in, uh, uh, in the woods and in the fields watching birds and, and paying close attention to their behavior and, and to their natural histories, I think that uh, images like the ones in Wilson, while they might look accurate to Audubon, would have looked false in a way because they just weren't um, what you would see if you went out and looked right. at those species. Yeah, in fact, a lot of earlier um bird depictions literally look like a dead bird on a table. <laughs> if yeah, you look at yeah, some of the early yeah. European ones, yep. it's clearly a shot duck 
flying. And it was, the same, it was the same with fish and amphibians yeah. and, and mammals. Um, th there's a lot of early natural history studies that are really gorgeous. Some of Mark Catesby's mm -hmm. work from yeah. uh, very early in the United States. Uh, a lot of beautiful work done. I, I would not disparage the artistic quality no. of any of those, but Audubon really kind of reshaped everything by bringing the animals to life, and that's the big difference with Audubon. We'll probe the details of that in a sec. I just okay. wanted to remind folks, um, this is a live broadcast. If you do have a question, please feel free to call the phone number. We'll run at the bottom of the screen in a minute, um, or use a push to talk, or any other means to communicate a question. Uh, William would be happy to answer. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll speak for you. <laughs> How did he create more realistic looking birds? Obviously he shot them mm -hmm. to uh, have enough time to observe them. He didn't paint them on the wing or anything. So what did he, what did he do differently when he got them back to the studio? Well, uh, early on he would do exactly that. He'd go out and shoot <laughs> a bird and lay it on the table and attempt to paint it. And, and uh, one day when he was probably 18, 19 years old and fr freshly in Philadelphia, he got an inspiration as he uh, later told it. and. Uh, got some wires and stuck his recently killed specimen into a mounting board. Basically kind of just skewered it right through the body of the bird and used the wires to kind of elevate the tail a little bit and maybe lift the head and spread out the wings. And so he found that he could actually pose his birds and put them into a more animated looking posture uh, in that way. And then the second great aid to his drawing, and this is really important, he would mark out a grid of squares on the mounting board and then lightly pencil in a matching grid on his drawing paper. And a lot of people are familiar with this technique. If yeah. you have an image superimposed against a grid, you, even someone with very little drawing uh, capacity can make a fairly accurate outline, at least, of, uh, of that image but on a, on a matching grid. And Audubon worked that way for the rest of his life. Wow. And that's one of the reasons that uh, all of his birds were done at life size and in a one-to-one -one ratio. <laughs> I was wondering about that, why yeah. he chose to make them. He was constantly size. advised to make his drawings smaller. The mm -hmm. sheer physical size of them discouraged a lot of people. It was very expensive to engrave and reproduce yeah. color images. And so the bigger the image it was, the more labor intensive and the more costly it was to, uh, to produce. And so there was a lot of economic pressure. Yeah. And, but he just wouldn't change. And I think he wouldn't change because he was married to his technique, and I think also because he understood intuitively that that made him different, and that the size, the scale that he worked at, really set his work apart. And I, and I think maybe we have an example. Okay. If you want to look here at, this is the American turkey, of course, and uh, this is a good example of why Audubon needed the double elephant yeah. size <laughs> paper, because this is painted at life size. Turkeys are very large animals. Uh, this one is walking through a, um, believe it or not, a stand of bamboo in Kentucky. And one of the things I had to research on the book was whether bamboo was indigenous to the Ohio River Valley, and, and it was. Uh, it was. It was, absolutely <laughs> was. There were stands of bamboo. They were called cane breaks by the, uh, by the locals, but there was native bamboo wow. throughout the Midwestern United States, and, and turkeys frequented that kind of habitat. Uh, obviously, with the turkey, you can't have it flying, you can't have it doing much because it barely fits onto the page. But I, I, this is why um, I think Audubon's work, whether uh, you're looking at one of the images that contains a lot of action and violence or one of the more stable images like this, still is arresting to people. And when you see this drawing in person at its full size, yeah. it is a very, very impressive piece of work. And this by the way, is the very first image in the Birds of America. Oh, wow. Of the 435 plates, this is plate number one. And one of Audubon's patrons in England loved this image so much that she had a, a sealing ring made of Sealing rings were used to press the wax onto yeah. a, a letter when you mailed it. And so when I was researching uh, Audubon's life and reading a lot of his correspondence, most of them, most of his letters that were written after he started publishing the Birds of America have a big blob of red wax on them with that American turkey pressed into it, and it's still there after all this time. Bill, I think we have a phone call, so okay. let's see if we have somebody calling in a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, this is Jeannie from Shepherdstown. Um, Bill, I had read when I was researching bird banding that Audubon was one of the first people to do bird banding, that he had banded Phoebes with a little piece of silver wire, and three of them came back after their migration. But he doesn't seem to be known so much for science application just for his art. Is it because his art was so powerful that 
some of the other stuff maybe you know, is kind of shadowed by that? Well, let me say a couple things. First of all, the bird banding experiment, uh, I think, was a bit of a subterfuge to spend time with his girlfriend in the woods. <laughs> he Audubon was, uh, married uh, uh, Lucy Bake Bakewell, who was the girl literally next door in Philadelphia. Her family owned a big farm next door to Audubon's, and he liked to take Lucy up into this little glen in the hills, and uh, there were Phoebes up there, and Audubon did do some banding experiments with them, I think just to satisfy his own curiosity about whether they came back and whether the same birds would be present from one season to the next. Um, but the Birds of America definitely has a scientific flavor and importance to it. In addition to the 435 um, color plates that depict the birds, there is a written text that runs to five volumes uh, called Ornithological Biography, which contains detailed natural history studies of every single species that Audubon illustrated. So you're given the taxonomical designation, which in a fair number of cases was given by Audubon. He actually discovered a large mm -hmm. number of birds and named them, but certainly found the correct classification, uh, measurements, um, behaviors, uh, nest descriptions, flight descriptions. So there's a lot of scientific information in uh, the Birds of America and in the accompanying um, letterpress that came with it. And in Audubon's time, a work like the Birds of America would not have been seen as being separate from science. It right. would have seen as been seen as being part of a naturalist view of the world, and that was inextricably part of science at that time. That's great. Jeannie, that was an excellent question. Thank yeah, you thank very you. much. It reminded me of another scientific experiment he performed that I had never heard of before your book. And I forget the bird, but it was a bird that was eating rice, and he used it to estimate how fast it was flying because he said rice was found no for yes. further north in North Carolina. And uh, you, you might know. be thinking of the passenger pigeon. Was uh, it the passenger? I, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. Um, Audubon. Uh, tried to make a calculation once of the, <laughs> yeah. the number of passenger pigeons in a very large flock. And to do that, he needed to estimate the, the size and density of the column and the speed at which it was flying. I think that may be the species you're referring to. I don't think the passenger pigeons fed on rice necessarily. It was a different bird. It was it might have been the Carolina parakeet. It could have been. And it, he claimed that it digested its food within 12 hours. And if he could find rice in its belly at a certain distance. In its crop, yes. He, calculated flew 60 miles an hour. Yeah, well, that is, the, that is the kind of observation that Audubon would have made. He wanted to know everything about yeah. birds. Uh, he wanted to know what they ate, what, what ate them. Uh, he wanted to know how they tasted. He, he Audubon ate, or at least tried to eat, every bird he ever shot at one time or another. And, uh, and his descriptions of birds often um, characterize whether they're uh, <laughs> worth trying or not. And he lived on birds for you know, long periods of, uh, of time. But, uh, so yeah, he certainly um, looked at birds from a very ecological perspective. He was interested in the whole spectrum of their existence, uh, not just the dead body that you might portray accurately, but where they came from and what kind of lives they led. What was his favorite bird to eat? Or one of the ones he enjoyed eating. Well, I'm, I'm sure he was a, a duck connoisseur. He spent a lot of time duck hunting. And, uh, of course, in those days, ducks were very, very numerous. And, yeah. and they were all out there and readily hunted pretty much any time of the year. Uh, so he was uh, certainly a duck connoisseur. I'm sure he liked turkeys. He spent a lot of time studying turkeys and devoted a huge amount of space into in his writings to, uh, to the American turkey. So he probably had... Uh, were there any birds he found indigestible? <laughs> I'm sure that there were. Uh, I, I think the uh, Carolina parakeet uh, was thought to be poisonous to dogs. And so Audubon may not have uh, tried to eat too much of those, but he did feed a couple to his dog. <laughs> the dog <laughs> ate them and died. survived just fine. So, yeah. Well, the Carolina parakeet is one uh, species that was subsequently lost, he described. And yes. then he had some encounters with the passenger pigeon. Tell us about... He did. Uh, one of the things that is important about Audubon, I think, is that he shows us what we used to have. Yeah. And there's nothing like seeing what we used to have to remind us how important it is to conserve what still remains. And uh, so uh, among, Audub among the species that Audubon painted, there are a number of extinct birds, including the Carolina parakeet, which was the only parrot species native to North America, uh, and the passenger pigeon, two very, very numerous um, uh, species of birds, both of which went extinct rather suddenly. Uh, their numbers fell from millions and millions, billions perhaps, birds to nothing uh, in the space of a few decades. And there are still 
debates as to why that happened. Uh, but Audubon had several encounters with, with passenger pigeons, including one sort of famous example when he was traveling on horseback between Henderson, Kentucky, where he lived, and Louisville. And he spotted on the horizon what he thought was a, a storm approaching, and it turned out to be a huge flock of passenger pigeons that, as it passed over him, he said, blocked out the sun, just like an eclipse, and the pigeon droppings fell like snow, and, and uh, the roar of the wings overhead just kind of lulled him into this trance. And uh, that same flock, as Audubon reports it, continued to pass overhead all the way as he rode into Louisville, and continued to fly over the city of Louisville for three consecutive days. Now, they may have been circling right. and coming back, but there was this basically uninterrupted passage of birds overhead for several days in a row. And of course, uh, in Louisville itself, people were shooting them like crazy yeah. and, and, uh, and uh, cooking them as fast as they could. Uh, so understanding that, that we once had a species like that, I think, is uh, important when we think about whether it's worth saving species that we still do have. Now, Audubon himself had a relatively itchy trigger finger, too. I mean, how many birds did he shoot? To <laughs> well, <laughs> he, he famously said once during a, one of his collecting expeditions that any day that he shot fewer than 100 birds was a lost day. But yeah, and I think you have to look at that statement in the context. That was when he was actually out working on the Birds of America, and he needed to acquire new specimens. Uh, in some cases, he was going to ship these to England to work on. You know, he would travel between England and the United States uh, to do his, his collecting. And uh, so he reasonably needed um, a pretty good sampling of many of these birds to be able to uh, work on them at a, at a later date. And he would do a sort of a rough taxidermy on them, basically gut them, stuff them with whatever he had, leaves or cotton, stabilize them with arsenic, usually, which he carried in big soap cakes or uh, powders, and uh, so he could make a rationalization for collecting lots of birds. But, but make no mistake, he shot birds because he liked doing it. He was an avid hunter, and like everyone else in the early 19th century, hunted because um, uh, he wanted food and, and also be for sport. He, he liked doing it. Do we know what ever happened to his bird collection? Well, some of them are at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. I've had a chance to examine oh, Holt, <laughs> and, and they ended up there. He was, but we should, we should leap ahead and say that everything that worked against Audubon in Philadelphia, his um, curious background, his, his paintings, uh, played to his favor when he got to England. Within a few weeks of getting off the ship in Liverpool, he had an exhibit at the Royal Society and went from one success to another and within a few months had secured the services of an engraver in Edinburgh and the work was later transferred down to to London and all of it completed there but um, they loved him in England yeah. and everything that made him look a little dicey a little phony some of his tall tales which nobody in England could uh, could double check you know worked to his advantage so uh, he was an overnight success there and then eventually uh, came back to the United States and was able to sell subscriptions to the Birds of America, including to the Academy of Natural Sciences. And, and uh, if you walk into the main library of the Academy in Philadelphia now, you'll see the Birds of America prominently displayed in a big display case. And if you want to see Wilson's American Ornithology, you have to ask him to bring it out of the back room. <laughs> So things change over they do. time. They and, do. And uh, before I ask you another question, just a reminder, if any of you have questions, please do call in. You've been talking about subscriptions. People like Audubon and Wilson had a, a, a rather different way of making a living than, than you do. Yes. <laughs> when you write books. Yeah. I, what is the subscription business? How did that work for these guys? Well, again, these uh, these prints were very difficult and expensive to produce. And, and I should explain that when you talk about an original Audubon, what you're really talking about is a, an, ori an original copy of an Audubon. Audubon would make a drawing, and sometimes it would be finished. Other times the background and certain botanical elements would be added at a later date, either by Audubon or by a series of assistants that he worked with. And then that image would be um, transferred in Audubon's case onto a copper plate. And that copper plate would be inked, and a black and white image would result, and then that would be hand colored by teams of colorists working to reproduce um, the original one. Um, it was a very, very um, expensive way and one that required an, an engraver whose artistic ability was the equal of, of, of Audubon to pull off. And so the only way that you could sort of finance this was uh, as a kind of pay-as-you-go scheme. And so what Audubon would do and what Wilson did also was to sell um, subscriptions 
that would come out in serial installments. And these would be shipped to Audubon subscribers um, five at a time. Each set of five prints was considered a number or a right. set. And so uh, in, in the Birds of America, there are whatever five into 435 numbers uh, uh, there are of uh, the com comprises uh, the Birds of America. And Audubon would then collect money from his subscribers as new installments were, were sent out. He was a very clever guy when it came to merchandising his work. And one of the things that he realized that he should do right away is divide up his um, the numbers such that uh, they'd offer a little something for everybody. So uh, although the turkey, for example, fills up the whole the whole right. page, and the peregrine falcon stretched from one side to the other. Um, a picture of a warbler sitting in the middle of one of these enormous double elephant folio pages isn't nearly impressive. And so uh, when a subscriber would open up a freshly delivered number of Audubon prints, the first one on top would be one of Audubon's big, impressive right. birds. would blow you away. And then the next few would be uh, medium-sized birds, and then the last one or two prints would be the little tiny warblers and sparrows and songbirds that were kind of lost on a sea of... Uh, White, although I think those images are really quite pretty, even when they're isolated in, in that way. So uh, each number that would arrive at a subscriber um, had a certain wow factor as soon as the case was cracked open. <laughs> and then what did the subscribers do with this pile of uh, portraits? They were almost uh, invariably bound into big leather volumes, and it, it would take either four or five volumes to com to contain mm -hmm. the entire 435 set. There were a total of about 200 sets we believe, that were made and sold to subscribers. There were additional loose prints that kind of got out of the engraver's shop, probably <laughs> when some money changed hands, that are floating around out there. Of the original 200 sets, complete sets, I, th I believe about 170 still exist, and are, their locations are known, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're, they're wonderful. Yeah. And they will last forever. The, uh, the paper that, that Audubon uses, it wears like iron. I've examined uh, 10 or 12 different sets, and they're in great condition. The National Gallery had an exhibit a couple of years ago. Yeah. And they had quite a few on display. And yeah, they looked, they looked wonderful. Yeah. Now, in an age of scanning, um, well, actually, before I go into this question, maybe we should look at some of the prints. Now sure. Now that our appetite. Let's go back to this one. This is... Um, well, this is the ruby-throated hummingbird, although you have to look closely yeah. to, to see it, don't you? Uh, is that his attempt to fill up the page? With well, <laughs> it's, there's a couple of things going on here. I think that what Audubon was trying to do here was to uh, give the viewer a sense of what hummingbirds are like in nature. And if you, see, if you watch hummingbirds, of course, they, they move very quickly. Yeah. They flit around. They uh, obviously come into flowers to feed. And so, you know, Audubon's perception of this species was of a very busy, humming, uh, you know, uh, rapidly moving uh, animal. There are, I, I believe there are 10 hummingbirds actually wow. in this image. Um, and they're kind of lost in the foliage, which is, again, how you see hummingbirds in nature. And so although you don't get any of the stark relief you get in some of the other images, you do get a sense of how hummingbirds make a living in the wild. Yeah. Um, this particular flower is a trumpet flower. And as with many of the botanical um, images in Audubon's work, he didn't make that drawing. That was made by his assistant, a young man named Joseph Mason, who accompanied Audubon from Cincinnati down to uh, New Orleans in 1820 as his assistant. Uh, Mason specialized in making drawings of plants and trees and, and flowers. He was also, Audubon thought he was just kind of a great kid to hang around with. He had been a student of Audubon, so when Audubon was forced to do a little teaching in, in Cincinnati, uh, when Audubon took him from um, Ohio down to uh, New Orleans, he was under the impression that Mason was 18 years old. In fact, when he made this drawing, Mason was probably closer to 13 years old. Um, and it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. his, his, Mason's work is really remarkable, and it's in a number of Audubon's um, uh, images. Let's take a look at now here we have the same bird that we saw before sitting on the stump in Alexander Wilson's representation. This is the barred owl. And I think what's happening here is if, if you kind of imagine maybe what this looked like just a few seconds earlier. I, I'm assuming the owl was sort of perched quietly on the branch, motionless, rotated its head in a kind of sinister looking way, spotted the squirrel and has now kind of whirled around and 
flared its wings out, and uh, the squirrel, still looking kind of clueless, doesn't really realize it's about to become lunch. <laughs> but there's a lot of things going yeah. on in this image, and so um, in addition to kind of getting the proportions and the scale right, um, Audubon has brought the owl to life in a way that it wasn't in, in American ornithology. Let's look at um, <laughs> this is a great one. what I think <laughs> is one of Audubon's. If, if you stop people on the street and, and ask mm -hmm. them what this is, a lot would say, uh, uh, well, that must be Audubon, because I think this is one of his signature images. Characteristic of really all of the large, long-necked birds that Audubon painted, um, this one has been posed to fit on the page. Again, you couldn't have him standing up completely upright and, um, and keep it at a, at a life size and fit it on to the page. And so with uh, herons and egrets and swans, you always find this characteristic, graceful, sinuous bending of, of the neck to make the uh, animal fit onto the page. The other thing that's interesting in this particular image, if you look right up at the top, you see what looks like, uh, looks as if someone has scribbled in pencil. Um, there's actually, a kind of, there is sort of a, a graphite drawn outline of a mandible, the lower jaw, right above the bird's shoulder, and then just off to the right, you see the detail of a foot. It's unclear to me why those are in there. They're in every single Everyone. one of the prints. They were in the engraving. But I think this was an attempt to lend, again, the sort of scientific credence to the Birds of America because this was something scientists did. They rendered little details of uh, anatomical uh, features sometimes with their renderings of specimens. And so I think these were just simply added on to make it look scientific in a way. Now Stephen Gould claimed the beak was wrong on this. <laughs> it's something he wrote called the flamingo smile. <laughs> well, uh, Audubon has many critics and who have he questioned. He said it was actually upside down. <laughs> I can't envision a flamingo. Um, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. I, I don't know that one. He was challenged on his depiction of a rattlesnake's fang. So he has a, there's a very memorable portrait that Audubon made of mockingbirds. And uh, these are mockingbirds. There's a group of them and around a nest. And there's a rattlesnake sort of climbing up this little mm -hmm. bush. And when you first look at the image, it looks like the snake is attacking the birds. In fact, it's the other way around. The birds are sort of hearing the snake and trying to scare it off from, from their nest. But uh, Audubon depicted, you know, to get all the action he could into the image, the snake with its fangs bared and, and uh, you know, in, uh, in a defensive posture. And there's a sort of recurve to the snake's fang that, that Audubon's myriad critics seized on to uh, demonstrate that he didn't know what he was talking about. In fact, he was right. Uh, rattlesnakes do have a slight recurve to their fang, or they can. He might have exaggerated a little bit, but he, he did have that correct. Audubon was also challenged on whether rattlesnakes climb trees and bushes or not. And they're really not very arboreal, but they can. Uh, mm -hmm. They can get up there. And if they were sufficiently hungry and there was something to eat up there, they might, they might go up. But um, there's no end to the stories of people who have complaints about Audubon's sure. accuracy. Although uh, one of the things that comes out so strongly in your book is he spent as much time as possible, humanly possible, observing nature. I mean, it, it's clear to the you know detriment of everything else, including his family and his business yeah. interests. If he could get outside, he went outside <laughs> and he, went on trips. He and, spent uh, he spent weeks and months at yeah. a time, <laughs> and uh, and because he was not a wealthy man for most of his life, this was either on horseback or on foot, right. and um, he was very very familiar with the American frontier. If um, if I were going to be lost in the wilderness, if I could have Audubon with me, I would feel comforted because he was a very, very able woodsman. He knew his way around. And um, he's hard to challenge on birds. He, Even though, um, as we saw with the peregrine falcons, he would sometimes imbue the birds with what we might say are human emotions, a look of fierceness, or in the case of the owl, the sort of threatening uh, uh, demeanor. He, would, he could accomplish that without ever kind of violating the accuracy of the drawing and, and the depiction of the birds. The, he always st sort of stayed right on the money with what birds actually look like and somehow got this feeling into them, yeah. which again, I think was uh, part of his technique, part of his strategy for uh, bringing them to life, to make them not look dead, but alive. Your next slide is actually a bird he seemed to have been very fond of. And <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the brown pelican uh, perched on a black 
mangrove branch. Audubon did paint the brown pelican several times. He, he was very uh, fond of this bird. And this particular drawing was made in 1833 uh, during a collecting expedition to the Florida Keys. And what I see in this picture is um, uh, a look about this bird that maybe suggests to me Audubon's mood at the time. Because by 1833, he finally felt confident that the Birds of America was going to be completed, that um, he was going to have enough subscribers to maintain the project, and that he was going to be finally recognized for the great artist and naturalist that he was. And so um, this bird, which looks pretty satisfied and maybe even a little smug to me, I think probably reflects Audubon's uh, um, a sense of himself at the time that he made the drawing. And again, it's, it's subtle. and. Uh, as with all of Audubon's large birds, it's, it's, it is a fairly static pose, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't look anything like um, Wilson's static poses from American Ornithology. There's a, there's a three-dimensional quality to it that, uh, that didn't exist before Audubon. In spite of his success with the, the Birds of America and his smug pose in the 1833s, you, you note after the Birds of America, um, he had kind of a sad ending to his life. Well, he went downhill very quickly. Yeah. And if you look at um, uh, paintings of Audubon that were done before and after the Birds of America, which took 13 years to complete, um, he aged pretty dramatically between the outset and the end of the project. It began in 1826. Um, it was completed in 1839. And in 1826, he was a formidable uh, uh, man, a woodsman from, from uh, the wilds of America, dressed in a wolfskin coat and carrying band bandoleros <laughs> across yeah. his chest. And, uh, and, and in a portrait done in 1840, at the end of the project, he's a kind of a little gray-haired man sitting quietly in a chair with his hands folded in his lap. And um, he did uh, uh, decline into an unspecified form of dementia uh, toward the end of his life and, and was really uh, not the same guy after the Birds of America, although he did launch a project to depict all the mammals of North right. America and uh, started that project, which was later completed by his son and by a couple of other collaborators. That was never as well known or as popular as his Birds of America. Why Part of it may be the title, which is the Viviparous <laughs> Quadrupeds of North America, yeah. which is the most convoluted way you could invent to say mammals. <laughs> Viviparous means uh, an animal that gives live live right. birth. Um, I suppose it's not as well known because um, he didn't do the whole project himself, although some of the images he worked on are really spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, for obvious reasons, it did not share um, uh, the ability that Audubon had in the Birds of America to represent things at life size. Right. You know, a bison will not fit on the double elephant folio, so uh, everything was reduced and it, it's, a, it's a different kind of work. Um, it also was launched uh, or completed, I suppose, um, either immediately prior to or during the Civil War. And so publishing took a real beating in that, that time period. And so I don't think it ever kind of got off the ground in the same way. Uh, certainly a very valuable and collectible artwork these yeah. days. Yeah. What is his legacy? Is it an artistic legacy? Is it an environmental legacy? I mean, what... what well... <clears throat> I think he's. Uh, I think he's left us a little bit of both. Um, certainly, he he shows us the world as it used to exist, which is always worth knowing about. Uh, in his written descriptions of masses of birds and waterfowl traveling, we get a sense of this sort of cyclical migration that was such a dominant aerial feature of North America. I mean, people now are only sort of dimly aware that ducks and geese go back and forth a couple of times a year, and it isn't the life-changing, set-your-calendar kind of event that it was back then. And so to read Audubon or to look at his images, I think, is to kind of reopen yourself to uh, the natural world that, to a large extent, still exists but in diminished or altered form. He, um, as I said earlier, he was really not a conservationist, but he did have a sense that things could change. And um, he, uh, he recognized that as 
people begin to settle the interior of the country and to clear the f woods and the fields and to begin to farm it. He was altering, they were altering or, or removing habitat for birds. Mm -hmm. You don't always remove birds when you, when you clear a forest. You just create a different uh, kind of multiplex of species sometimes. And uh, he understood that as well. His one near epiphany on this account occurred in um, when he was living or traveling through Natchez on his way down to New Orleans. And he had stopped there for a couple of days. And tied up at the landing in Natchez were a number of big rafts of logs that were being drifted down to sawmills in, in New Orleans, probably for export back to, um, to, uh, to Europe. And as he was standing on the wharf one day and looking at these logs, he realized he was probably looking at the woods that he used to hike through, being floated off and, sure. and uh, sent to another part of the world. And uh, that, gave him, that gave him pause. So I think if you look back to his... Um, kind of uncertain relationship to um, uh, the natural bounty of the country, that, that you sort of see that point at which everything is about to suddenly begin to evolve and people recognize that um, there are limits to uh, nature's ability to withstand assaults of all kind. And he sort of, again, s sort of moved us right up to that fault line where you get that, that changeover, I think. Because I really do think that when the Audubon Society comes into existence, you know, a few decades after he's gone, that, that is an important benchmark in, in um, kind of motivating the average citizenry to take a look around and, and uh, pay attention. Well, that's a good way to go out, William. Thank you so much. The, the name of the book is Under a Wild Sky, John James Audubon and the Making of the Birds of America. It really does bring the man and his era and the environment alive. It was a wonderful book, a pleasure to read. I'd like to thank you for coming out Thanks, here Mark. to give two talks. Thanks I'd very much. I'd like to thank all of you who took the time this afternoon to tune in for an hour. We appreciate you um, learning a little more about Audubon. And I'd like to remind you that the next in this series will be in March, mid-March, when we're going to show a new film from a National Park Service filmmaker named Chuck Dunkerley called Land of Dreams. So thank you.